Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon. MMU Postgraduate Virtual Open Day or PGVOD we call it, MMU Postgraduate Virtual Open Day 2021 is here. We're having a lunch talk entitled Artificial Intelligence in Medical Imaging and AI Robots. Uh, log your dates with us, MMU uh, Postgraduate Virtual Open Day starting from the 23rd till the 29th of August 2021 on MMU Facebook page and MMU YouTube channel. Learn more about the postgraduate program at MMU and discuss your education options in person with our academics virtually. So don't miss the opportunity to register with us. Just log on to our web page and start your next education chapter with us. So MMU Postgraduate Virtual Open Day will be hosted by me, yes. Me, Mustafa, a lecturer, academic counselor, happening live now. Save your date and time with us. Today we have two speakers. Uh, let me start with the first speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Faisal Ahmad Fauzi. He is an Associate Professor at Faculty of Engineering. He'll be speaking on a title, Artificial Intelligence in Medical Imaging. Over to you, Dr. Faisal, with your topics. Okay, thank you, Mustafa. I uh, hope my voice is uh, very clear. Um, welcome to this, uh, the first talk of uh, today. Okay, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Muhammad Faisal Ahmad Fauzi. I'm an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Engineering. Uh, I'm also the head for the MMU, UKM, and IMU AI4DP Research Excellence Consortium. Okay, AI4DP means Artificial Intelligence for Digital Pathology. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, AI uh, or Artificial Intelligence for Medical Imaging. Uh, so this is the outline okay, of uh, my brief talk today. Okay, I'll go a bit on the introduction. Okay, basically I'll talk about the imaging informatics, the cancer and diseases. Okay, and then uh, following that we'll talk about uh, a bit about uh, radiology. Okay, and pathology. Okay, when we talk about medical imaging, okay, these are the two branches okay, of medical imaging that uh, uh, people usually work on, okay, radiology and pathology. So for each of these, I'll go a bit about their, uh, you know, the imaging modalities, okay, the workflow, okay, followed by a bit of a, a simple example on uh, computer-aided diagnosis. Okay. And then at the end, I'll share a bit about um, our research work at MMU okay, in this area. So hopefully uh, for those uh, looking for postgraduate studies, okay. Uh, if you're looking for postgraduate by research, okay, uh, you'll get example of you know, the kind of uh, research work we are doing at MMU. So move on to the introduction, okay. Uh, when we talk about medical imaging, okay, um, you know, first thing you need to know is the uh, imaging informatics, okay. It's a subfield of medical uh, biomedical informatics, okay. Uh, it deals with image generation. Okay, image manipulation, image management, and image integration. Okay. And uh, medical imaging basically, you know, uh, uh, will have something to do with uh, each one of these. Okay, in terms of generation, okay, they are generate images and convert them into digital. Uh, in terms of manipulation, this is most of the works. Okay, um, uh, AI uh, is working on this. Okay, the pre and post processing to enhance, visualize, or analyze images to interpret images. Next, we have image management, okay, um, you know, for storing, transmitting, displaying, retrieving, and organizing images. Okay, and finally, for image integration, uh, to combine images okay, with other information needed for uh, interpretation, management, and other tasks. Okay. Um, a bit of a basic, okay, when we talk about medical imaging, we talk about image processing, okay, uh, machine learning, and then to AI. So when we talk about images, okay, these are the things that is important. Images are made of uh, pixels. So th these are very basic information uh, regarding medical imaging. Okay, any images are made up of this pixel. Consists of uh, the resolution determines the quality of the images. Okay. And medical images also can be in 3D. Okay, when it comes to 3D, then we call it a voxel. And uh, it can also come in time series. Okay, later we'll show some example of a uh, time series. Uh, medical images. Uh, so for time series, then basically, you know, it, it's a function of time. Okay, so you can view them uh, continuously or 
uh, moving. Uh, next on cancers okay, and the diseases. Uh, usually we apply okay, uh, AI in medical imaging to help us to, to assist the doctors to diagnose diseases, okay, uh, especially cancers, but also some other uh, other important diseases as well, okay, like diabetes, Alzheimer, okay, and so on. Uh, but here we'll focus a bit more on cancer, okay. Uh, because I think cancer is uh, very prevalent okay, in uh, our country and also in worldwide. Okay? It's actually a, a disease in which uh, some of the body cells grow uncontrollably okay? and then start to spread to other parts of the body. Okay? And there are many different kinds of cancers. Okay? There are more than 100 types of cancers. Okay? They usually uh, name okay, for the organs or tissues where they, are, you know, they originate from, for example, uh, blood cancer, okay, breast cancer, brain cancer, okay, there are more than hundred types of cancers. Okay. And uh, here, this is uh, from the you know the 2016 estimates, okay, um, you know for male and female the, in terms of uh, new cases for male prostate cancer is um, you know uh, of make the majority of it for female is breast cancer, okay, so. Uh, uh, these are in terms of new cases, but when we talk about uh, estimated death, okay, for both male and female, the prostate and breast cancer um, you know, occupy the second place because the first place actually goes to the lung and bronchus cancer. Okay, this is especially if you are a smoker. Okay, so um, in terms of death, okay, these are the types of cancers that is uh, uh, provide the uh, the most okay uh, cases for male and female. <laughs> And then, you no, know, when we when you are diagnosed with cancer, okay, or you no know, any disease detection, um, your uh, doctors or your radiology, okay, basically will need to study. Okay, for example, you have an X-ray, you have a uh, whatever scans, um, they need to analyze, okay, and they need to observe, okay, uh, in order to understand, okay, uh, the behavior of the disease, okay. But more more often, they are going to have uh, to miss. Okay, uh, for example, breast cancer is missed like 10 to 30 percent by even expert mammographers. Okay, and uh, this uh, misses, okay, basically is due to you know, several uh, observational lapses, okay, including fatigue. Okay, uh, after some time, the doctors are tired, so they tend to miss, okay, uh, uh, some of the, you know, the, the tumor cells. Uh, you know, distraction is another factor, emotional stress. Okay. In fact, uh, we also have variation in readers. Okay. Different doctors okay, may interpret differently. Okay. And uh, as well as satisfaction of search. Okay. And um, the sensitivity okay, of the radiologist in detecting the breast cancer can improve by 15% uh, through double reading. So for example, okay, uh, this is example for the uh, uh, lung cancer. Okay, when we talk about lung cancer, we are looking for the lung nodule. Okay, we have two examples here. One is uh, 20 millimeter nodule, okay, which is quite uh, obvious. Okay, but you also have four millimeter nodules, very small, uh, even expert, you know, uh, radiologists or expert doctors can uh, miss this kind of uh, nodules or abnormalities. Uh, for example, here you have another example of a lung cancer. Okay, reader one or doctor number one. Okay, probably they are only able to you know to to detect okay uh, one cancers in uh, one nodules in red here. Okay. The second uh, doctors probably they can detect another one. Okay, which is quite uh, obscure. Okay, if you can see the images uh, clearly, and reader three can now detect three of them. Okay, so even between uh, different doctors, there are variations okay, in uh, detecting okay, the nodules, the abnormalities okay, in your uh, sample. So this gives a rise to you know, this uh, computer-aided diagnosis. Okay? So computer-aided diagnosis means we want to use computer algorithm, we want to use a computers okay, to help the doctors to diagnose the disease. Okay? And this uh, you know, uh, bring the rise of uh, artificial intelligence okay, in medical imaging. Okay? It's a diagnosis made by a physician okay, using the output of a computerized system. Okay? 
And uh, when we talk about computerized system, we mean the automated, e automated image or data analysis. Um, so computer edit analysis have um, many uh, benefits, okay? In terms of quality, they can improve the analysis, okay? They can reduce the error. Remember the error because of fatigue, okay? And also because many other observational lapses uh, mentioned just now, okay? Um, uh, they can also provide uh, better views, okay? And in terms of productivity, they can improve the workflow. They can reduce turnaround times. Okay, some cases, especially for cancer, the doctors can take about two or three hours to analyze a single uh, uh, biopsy sample. Okay, so with computer edit diagnosis, this can be done faster and also can be uh, more consistent. Okay, uh, because we don't have uh, variation between readers and so on. Okay. And of course, you know, uh, with computer edit diagnosis, you can provide more innovation. Okay. And uh, that's basically the you know the uh, why uh, AI in medical imaging is getting uh, you know, a lot of momentum right now. Next, I'm going to go a bit okay uh, on the radiology and pathology. Okay, so when we talk when we talk about medical imaging, okay, most more often than not, the images that you're going to use will fall under these two, either radiology or pathology. So we need to know a bit about radiology. Okay. Uh, in general, radiology is a branch of medicine that uses imaging technology to diagnose and treat disease. Okay. There are different imaging modalities. Okay, uh, maybe some of these you have encountered. Okay, at least at least one of them. For example, the X-ray. Everybody have uh, should already be familiar with. Okay, so it can be divided into these anatomical and functional uh, modalities. Uh, for example, X-ray, fluoroscopy, CT, MRI scan, ultrasound, these are under anatomical modalities. And then we have the PET scan, SPEC scan, and functional MRI under the functional imaging modalities. And as I mentioned earlier, okay, uh, radiology images, okay, it can be 2D, 3D, or even 4 dimension, okay, 4D. And to display and organize you know, uh, all these images, for radiology, they have a standard uh, system called the PATS, Picture Archiving and Communication Systems. And uh, all the images okay, uh, uh, have a, the same, uh, are using the same format called the DICOM, Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine. So we'll go a bit uh, on each of these uh, different modalities. I think X-ray is, uh, everyone is very familiar. Okay, They use the X-ray <coughs> uh, <coughs> wavelength okay, to obtain information, okay, uh, invisible information, okay, to the naked eye. So, for example, I think you, everybody <coughs> is familiar about X-ray, okay, they should be able to uh, provide images of the bone structure and so on. Okay, in fact, in, uh, uh, not only in medical imaging, um, you know, in security, for example, in airport security, uh, they are also using the X-ray uh, ima uh, images. Next one is fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is similar to X-ray, except they are moving. Okay, there's a bit of animation here. You can see uh, it's a continuous acquisition of uh, X-ray images over time. So usually, you know, uh, you are you know, the patient is asked to to swallow, for example, uh, swallow some liquid, or they are injected with a liquid, and then they are you know they are exposed with this uh, fluoroscopy, and then we can see, okay. The you know the the movement of the liquid okay and then of course uh, we can make further study based on that. Um, next we have the CT scan, computed tomography. Uh, uh, basically, I think the, the the images on the bottom right, oh, sorry, bottom left, okay, shows uh, the equipment for CT where you have to. Uh, lie still, okay, on, uh, and then they have this uh, very big machinery, okay, uh, that we rotate in order to uh, obtain okay, the CT scans of your <coughs> uh, of your body parts, okay. The example given here is for the <coughs> CT scan of a head, okay, where you have, uh, you can have um, uh, different uh, scans, okay, from different uh, depth of your head. Okay. In fact, you can actually make this into a, a 3D uh, volume computed tomography. Okay. 
So this example of how you know uh, we obtain this. Okay, just a bit of uh, animation here. Okay, when the machines rotate, okay, they will capture the readings. Okay, and then from the reading, okay, they will do the filtered back pro uh, projection in order to produce, okay, the CT images. Okay, so this is the kind of CT images okay, that we have. Okay, another time uh, for the animation. <clears throat> Okay, next we have the MRI. Okay, MRI is like CT, okay, except that um, they are using radio, uh, radio wave. Okay, CT is using uh, X-ray wave, okay, MRI is using radio wave. So in this case, they, they are non-iodizing uh, and then uh, they, are, they have excellent soft tissue contrast detail. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, of course, we have ultrasound. Uh, this is especially if you are, you know, for those uh, uh, pregnant ladies, okay, or even uh, if you have injury in the muscle, okay, sometimes they use ultrasound imaging. This is the kind of ultrasound images produced, okay, meaning that they use the ultrasound technology uh, based on the, you know, the sound wave or ultrasound wave. Okay, they created or produce or generate these uh, images based on the, you know, uh, reflection of the sound wave. It can be 2D or 3D, okay, uh, uh, and this also uh, is improving, okay, uh, over the years. We also have this, what we call the nuclear imaging, okay, nuclear imaging means, I think that the, the device used is more or less similar, you can see they have a circular ring, okay, to rotate around your body, okay, but for nuclear imaging, you need to uh, uh, consume or inhale, um, you know, uh, radioactive agent. Okay, you need to inject it, inhale or ingested. Okay, uh, radioisotopes. Okay, and then based on that, they will do the imaging, and then you have, for example, here, okay, a bit more detail, okay, about the, you know, the, the analysis that can be done. So for radiology, this is a simple example of. Um, you know, uh, simple CAT system, okay, involved of pre-screening, CNN classifier, clustering, okay. It can be more complicated, but this one will should give example of a simple one, okay. So after the pre-screening, okay, you have uh, initial uh, detection after the, after the classifier, okay, you differentiate uh, true positive, okay, and false positive, okay, and then after the clustering, finally, you have the correct uh, micro classification, okay, for this uh, breast cancer. I'm going to talk a bit about the digital pathology. Um, so pathologists are experts at interpreting microscopic views of body tissues. Uh, basically, it involves those uh, tissue samples that you know they've been uh, prepared on a slide, and then they don't study the slides under the microscope. And what they will see is the you know all the individual cells. Okay, so to know the grading of your cancer, the staging of your cancer, we need this. Okay, we cannot just base on the radiology anymore. Okay. So in general, okay, we the the flow is they provide uh, we obtain okay the cancer sample, we prepare them on a slide, and then either we use the microscope or now we use the uh, scanner, okay, with the digital pathology era. And <clears throat> uh, these are the workflow, okay. The pink one are the analog. Uh, workflow that we are currently trying to replace it with the digital workflow in blue okay and uh, this area has become you know has uh, exploded recently because you know only recently the the us fda allows the marketing of uh, <clears throat> the whole slide imaging system okay for digital pathology uh, so a lot of uh, you know computed computer edit diagnosis okay, is currently being developed in terms of scopes, okay, uh, for digital pathology, there's a lot of things we can do. Okay, we can do detection, for example, we can do tissue segmentation, cell detection, uh, or segmentation, okay, in order to identify the abnormal cells. You can do diagnosis, okay, uh, including cell counting, classification, structural analysis, uh, tumor grading, and so on. You can do also prognosis, okay, to to predict the uh, uh, to score the predictive marker and then to suggest 
uh, suitable treatment, especially in the era of uh, precision medicine. Okay. And um, now, let me just uh, share a bit of an uh, example of the research work. Okay. Excuse me. That we are doing at MMU. Okay, both radiology and pathology. For radiology, we have lung segmentation. Okay, in uh, chest X-ray. <coughs> Uh, we also have segmentation of uh, <coughs> CT head scans. Okay, uh, this is our work uh, several years ago. Uh, we also have content-based image retrieval of uh, you know of these CT images or radiology images, meaning that sometimes new doctors okay they are not very sure uh, of the diagnosis to be done. So what they can do is they can retrieve similar cases. Okay, based on the content of the images. Okay. And then based on the retrieve images, they can refer to the diagnosis, okay, and then this can help them, especially for the new doctors, okay, the new radiologists uh, <clears throat> with, uh, with their diagnosis. For pathology, we have uh, tumor budding detection. Okay, uh, for example, this is the example of uh, <clears throat> uh, colorectal cancer. Okay, we want to determine what we call this uh, tumor bud, okay, which basically can determine what kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, prognosis or treatment okay, that can be done for this particular patient. Okay, we have a, a pattern file with the US uh, Patent Office okay, as well as several uh, <coughs> journal and conference publication. Okay. Another example here is the follicular lymphoma grading. This is a type of blood cancer. Okay. We develop a system to grade follicular lymphoma and then this uh, can assist the doctors. Okay, usually the doctors. This is example of where the doctors spend like three hours to study just one particular sample. So with this uh, computer aided diagnosis, this can reduce to let's say uh, around five to ten minutes. Okay, uh, reduces a lot of the uh, pathologist time. Okay, which can be very beneficial to both pathologists as well as cancer patient. Okay. Uh, final example is on the tumor biomarker scoring. This is for breast cancer. We want to determine what type of uh, treatment uh, suitable okay, for uh, this kind of patient. So basically first we detect the cells, we do the scoring and then from the scoring we can tell uh, what which particular treatment is uh, suitable. Okay, With that I think, uh, thank you, I think I end my presentation. I'll pass back to Encik Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you. Well Dr. Fauzi, it was very uh, detailed, in-depth, precise, concise on the topics uh, discussed. Okay, for our next speaker, I would like to call uh, Professor Dr. Ku Wun Chen, uh, this is the Professor at Faculty of Engineering and Technology, with his title, AI Robots. Over to you, Dr. Ku. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mustafa, and hi, everyone. Are you today? So um, today I would like to talk about AI robots. I am from a uh, Faculty of Engineering and Technology, uh, Multimedia University. So uh, today I just want to highlight a few things uh, and share with you about AI uh, and show you some example of AI robots. Um, so first, let us talk about <laughs> AI. Uh, I'm sure all of you, you heard about AI. You no, know, this is a very hot uh topics uh uh recently okay um when well when we are talking about ai now first thing we have to uh also try to understand is about uh how the ai comes about uh if you look at the uh development of these uh scientific um you know, uh, and technologies it's all about it comes from the curiosity of mankind Okay, so we would like to know or seek for the answer for the unknown. So scientific knowledge is actually based on observation of nature. From observation, uh, scientists try to find patterns and generalize rules of nature. Okay, then they will try to uh, do experiment again, you know, analyze the results and, and try to see whether whatever they have, uh, 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 their, their findings, whether it matched to uh, all the phenomena of the, uh, the the general rules of the nature. Okay, so this is about scientific methods, and uh, in order for us to do all these things, uh, one of the key, very key element is actually to collect the data. Now, um, well, if we want to uh, 
uh, uh, do any experiment. Definitely, you no know, from your schools, uh, science experiments, uh, to whatever uh, things that we 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 do to do the observation, we need data. Yeah, we need to collect some data, experimental data, and then we want to analyze the data and try to fit our data to a model so that we can predict that yeah, uh, whatever uh, that it's going to happen in the future. And to do the data analysis, uh, there are generally, we have two methods. Okay? One is an analytical method and the other is a numerical method. Okay? So analytical method, basically you have formulas, you try to solve a set of equations and then you get the exact uh, solution. So this uh, would be uh, the best, okay? but it may not be always the case because there are so many different types of problem in the world that you may not be able to get an exact analytical solution. Okay, so uh, people, uh, there are many people when we try to solve some problem, you may not be able to get an exact solution. So what we will do is we try to go for another method, which is a numerical method. Okay, so numerical methods here, it is actually uh, about uh, making guesses at the solution and try to test uh, whether the problem is solved or not. Okay, and uh, and, and we try to see if the errors between the, the our guess and the exact solution, they are very close together or, or close enough, then we can stop, okay? So uh, just to share you a bit on uh, some uh, program flow, uh, for those that if you are familiar with uh, the uh, programming, okay? Uh, normally what we do is like, for example, say we try to construct a relationship between uh, input and output, okay? Of certain phenomena. Uh, for example, say you want to know about uh, the velocity or the speed of a vehicle. Then you make an observation. Okay? Uh, you measure the speed. And then after that, you try to formulate a relation between the time and also the velocity. Okay? Then uh, if you want to go for numerical computing or, or analysis, we try to make a guess. Okay? What is the, the, uh, your, your, your parameter? For example, say uh, the distance or the velocity. Okay? Then after that, you fit into your model and see whether the error is uh, small enough or not. If not, then you continue to try an error and get another uh, uh, value. And then you fit into the model and see, well, if the error is small enough, then you say, all right, I am happy with this solution. Then this is my answer. Okay. So this is a kind of a numerical analysis. Well, if you want to do that, okay, um, to solve uh, the, net, the, the, the general problems okay, in the world, Okay. It is possible, uh, but provided two things. One is you must have data. You must have sufficient number of data. The other one is we must have a power to come to process the data. Meaning we need to uh, have we need to have a computer. Okay. So data processing is actually uh, very important if you want to analyze uh, whatever problem that we want to solve. Especially if the problem is very complicated, then you need a very uh, powerful computer. Okay. So in the past, when we first have the computer, uh, the first computer is called Enid. Okay? Uh, it was uh, designed and uh, uh, operation uh, in the year of uh, 40, 40, 46, okay? 1946. Okay? At that time, the computer uh, performance is not that great. So uh, a lot of processing uh, we cannot do yet. Okay? But as a time goes, okay? today we are 2022, uh, 21, okay? uh, at the moment our you look at our computer system, you know we have even a smartphone that can be a a, a, a small mini computer system that uh, the processing power everything it will be uh, far more better than whatever we have in the past fifty years. So uh, at today, uh, uh, technologies it is it makes possible that the the processing power that has reached a stage where we we can uh, process the data and make a lot of wonders uh, out of this. So um, in terms of the uh, data processing, okay, what uh, we or the scientists would like to do is actually uh, we we'll try to uh, do some prediction okay, or you want to do some forecasting. Okay? Example, say uh, you want to uh, predict the stock market. Okay? Uh, in order for you to predict this, maybe you need uh, lots of data past historical data and maybe you also need to add a bit of uh, other elements like uh, today's uh, political news and others influence uh, fit into the models for you to get a better uh, uh, prediction 
uh, we also have uh, used this kind of uh, data processing analysis okay, for many different uh, problems. Okay? So one particular one is uh, to imitate a human. That means we want the computer or the, the, the processor to understand about you know, uh, the behavior of a human and try to imitate a human. Uh, so uh, that is a very famous uh, test we call it a Turing test okay, of uh, AI which is actually uh, um, uh, it is a, a very simple experiment okay, whereby say for example uh, you have uh, a person okay, this person talk to two, uh, uh, two, two uh, machines okay. one is actually a computer and this computer uh, is actually uh, with uh, artificial intelligence and then uh, there's, he also talked talk to another person okay and this person also uh, try to talk to the uh, this uh, tester through a, a form of a communication uh, for example say uh, now uh, we, we use whatsapp okay so uh, this uh, tester he tried to communicate with a human and also a computer with ai through say whatsapp okay and if if you cannot differentiate whether you are now talking to a person a real person or uh, a computer that means this computer already have an intelligence equivalent to a human okay so uh, ai or this uh, ai robot uh generally there are a lot of things that we we actually uh want the the robots to do okay like for example uh you now we would like the robots to be able to talk to the human in a natural way okay? now if you look at a lot of uh robots uh they still cannot do this because uh, uh no first we have to solve uh issue like for example uh the speech recognition uh then uh how to do the natural language processing you now how to do the translation you no know, uh human when we speak we have emotion uh we speak in different tone now all these things is actually uh something very fuzzy okay uh, something that uh if without intelligence uh we will not be able to uh, uh just to write a simple program to let the robot to understand all this uh, other things that uh, we will say the robot will have ai is like for example can the robot write an essay yeah okay? or can the robot uh, say uh, beat uh, the world champion the chess champion yeah okay? or can the robot actually uh, no uh, answer a, a very layman uh, questions okay so uh, in the past uh, we uh, so the first generation of AI actually started by trying to program. Okay, uh, we try to program the the robot to to think like humans or to act as a human. Okay, so basically at that point, uh, everything is all pre-programmed. Okay, it is not something that uh, uh, no uh, the robot can think by itself. It's everything in a code in a program manner. Uh, but of course, the program can be a very powerful program. You can put in uh, many other possibilities. Okay? But there are things that uh, a sequential programming, a classical programming cannot do. Like for example, things like common sense. Uh, a human, we have common sense. But how can you teach a, a robot to have common sense? Yeah? Uh, how can we teach the robot to, have, to learn from past experience? This is uh, the, the biggest issue in a... Uh, classical or conventional programming language uh, then later there they are there are few scientists a uh, very a uh, genius in uh, mathematics uh, that come up with some approach okay? uh, instead of we write a program okay, uh, a sequential manner to to teach the robot to do a to z okay? now uh, we don't we do not actually need to to do that kind of uh, uh, programming uh, steps eh? instead uh, the we feed the robot with a, a large number of data okay? and based on that data the robot will try to pick up all the the features and then try to learn by using a statistical analysis uh, method so uh, that comes to the second generation of the ai where we call it as a machine learning okay? i'm sure uh, many of you also heard about this machine learning okay? and now is uh, the other uh, more hot is called uh, deep learning Okay. So basically for machine learning, uh, the robots or the, the AI co uh, processor, they try to learn directly from the data. Okay? So we feed a, a, a large number of data, try to process the data and then extract the features and train a model so that the robot or the, the computer recognize 
uh, this kind of features, you know, classify them into a groups that uh, they have the common uh, common features, then they are under the same group and so on. So we try to iterate until there's a group enough uh, uh, model come out that it fit into the application or the, to solve the problem. Okay. Uh, one very, very good example is actually, uh, you know, AlphaGo. Okay. Uh, the, the AI, AI, uh, programs, okay, that beat the world champion. So this actually, uh, the goal is a very complex uh, uh, game, okay, uh, uh, board games, uh, and and uh, it is not that easy. Okay? In the past, that uh, we train a program, that uh, you no, know, we write a program to solve this uh, puzzle or the, the the chess problem. Okay, but AlphaGo they use different approach. It is actually using a deep learning whereby uh, it try to fit a uh, many data. Okay and try to have a learning, try to recognize the features of every uh, loops, okay? or we call all this as an uh, e-box, okay? and try to analyze uh, deep enough so that for them to get a good uh, solution. Okay? So uh, based on this uh, data, okay? uh, we call it as a big data means a, a large volume of data. And also based on this deep analysis, it makes the AI uh, possible today. Okay? Uh, so let me go to another uh, uh, topics, which is uh, robots. Okay, so AI is actually related to uh, we can say is related to the programming, uh, related to the method that we use to solve uh, problems, which is open-ended problems. Okay, you may not have an exact solution. Uh, this kind of problem, like for example, uh, uh, say related to human behavior. Okay. Uh, related to uh, something that we cannot, we cannot uh, show the robots okay, uh, to do it uh, by using a very uh, 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 systematic or sequential uh, kind of uh, programming structure. Okay? Like for example, say you want to uh, ask a robot to walk, okay? uh, you can program it to say, okay, first I want to uh, move this motor with uh, 90 degree then you move the, the knee with uh, 45 degree, and then you move your toe uh, with 30 degree. You know? After that, uh, we switch or, or, or move the, the body uh, to the left or to the right. Okay? So we can do this programming. But then if it is not uh, by learning, okay? uh, if we look at a human, uh, when we, we, we as a, you know, uh, from, from the childhood time, or, or say as a, as a baby boy or baby girl, okay? you start to learn how to walk. Okay? Uh, they don't really, uh, no, uh, you don't really need to give them the instruction like, no, uh, try to uh, no, uh, use this muscle to, to uh, move your leg up and down. No? Uh, they learn by experience. They learn by uh, no, mistake. So uh, we do the same uh, in, in training the robot to behave okay? to, to, so that they can imitate the behavior of a a human by collecting a uh, uh, sufficient enough uh, number of data okay through all this training they will try to pick up what is the more efficient way to uh, walk for example okay so uh, if we talk about the AI robot okay uh, normally we are talking about uh, these few categories the first one is a humanoid robot okay so humanoid robot is a robot with the body shape built to resemble the human body okay uh, a very famous one is the Honda robot. Okay? So Honda robot has gone through a very uh, a few generations. Okay? And today the Izumo is one of the uh, state of the art of the human robot where they can actually interact with the human. Uh, they have a cell sus uh, uh, sustained uh, battery, battery operated. They are able to move, uh, able to walk, okay? uh, able to climb up a staircase and so on. And also, uh, there's another feature of a humanoid robot or AI-based uh, robot is they can express uh, the, 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 and respond to a human emotion. Okay? Um, and uh, there are also other types of uh, no, uh, robots that uh, try, to, uh, try to imitate the uh, human-like characteristic. Okay? Uh, human, uh, Honda robot, the NASA uh, robot not, okay? you can actually uh, get some uh, uh, find some videos okay, uh, from these uh, YouTube and other links. Uh, okay, um, so 
uh, the research of AI robots started, I think, uh, uh, almost uh, in the year like late uh, 90s okay, uh, to 20s. That whereby uh, there are many groups of researchers, they try to first is of course to construct a robot okay, uh, where the robots can uh, resemble a human uh, body with human head, uh, human arm, you no know, human hand, and also uh, some with, with a human leg. Okay? So every one of these actually involve a different uh, types of uh, study and also uh, uh, R&D work. Okay? Uh, this particular one is called COP. It's actually a 22 degree of freedom, 44 sensors kind of uh, robot. And what these robots can do is actually uh, some of the uh, uh, simple games that okay? he can play and then try to observe how the human play the games and then he will try to you know, uh, follow and copy. Uh, uh, today, there are some AI robots that actually already been commercialized. Okay? One particular one is called a social robot. Okay? A social robot may not be uh, same as, uh, the, the look may not be exactly the same as a human, but it's actually an autonomous robot that interact and communicate with human or other autonomous physical uh, agents by follow the social behavior. So uh, social robot, it, the emphasis, uh, the emphasis is more on the expression, okay? the emotional behavior that this social robot can uh, uh, perform. Okay? Uh, like for example, uh, I'm sure you you, are, you know about the AI assistant by Amazon. Okay? Uh, and also there are some of uh, these uh, new robots called Jibo and also Ido, where they kind of you know, can interact with uh, kids or even uh, adults and then help them to plan their schedule, daily schedule, you know, uh, to tell them about the weather of today, you know, to make some appointment and let them know uh, what they, they need to do, uh, to do list. Okay? So they can uh, kind of like, you know, interact the human uh, in a more natural way. Uh, there's another group of uh, research also going on, which is on the Android robot. Okay? So Android robot is a different group of robot where it try to design to resemble a human and also uh, try to make up by using a fresh light material okay, with skin, teeth, hair. Okay? And, and this like, no, uh, uh, it looks exactly the same as human uh, today. Okay? But of course, uh, there's a, a, a pro and con. Okay? There are some people that cannot accept uh, this kind of uh, Android robot okay? because some may say it's too scary. Yeah? You imagine that you, you, you uh, meet uh, a robot that okay? look exactly the same as a human. Uh, uh, at night, okay, for example, okay, and uh, they are they are not human, okay, and uh, but they they are uh, their behavior, everything it looks like human, so it it could be looks like a, a corpse, okay. So uh, the development of Android robots started in the year of uh, uh, late twenties or so, uh, whereby there are few groups, okay, uh, in 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 the world that they work on this uh, kind of uh, robot, okay. Uh, one particular one I would recommend you to take a look is uh, this one by Professor uh, Schaffer from Denmark. Okay? This is a this is actually a robot. You know, it's a robot. If you look at their uh, if remove out the skin, this is actually uh, the internal part of the robot. It it has a, a lot of uh, actuators, uh, micro robots, uh, micro ro uh, motors, where it will have a very good representation of the 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 muscle of the uh, uh surrounding the face okay so it is very real yeah okay? but it's actually just a half a body yeah okay? uh, uh underneath here this is a, a is is a machine okay? these are all are here this is the robot okay the the, the front here are the robots and the back here there is a, the real human okay so this is also uh, another uh, direction uh moving forward there okay, for AI robots. Okay? And of course, if I talk, we are talking about AI robots, the, the one of the most famous one today is uh, Sophia. Sophia uh, AI social robot. Okay? Uh, this AI uh, Sophia robot, it can actually uh, try understand uh, a normal, uh, normal uh, uh, a lay person okay, speaking in a natural manner. Okay? It has a very powerful uh, computer system that can recognize uh, uh, this uh, natural language and then it can also have um, intelligence to respond uh, in real time on uh, different types of uh, questions okay uh, it's very interesting and i i will recommend you also 
uh, try to look at some of these uh, videos uh, related to Sophia robots. Okay? Um, there are also other types of uh, robots uh, developed uh, where it has a certain form of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so like for example, uh, the companion robots, uh, iPods, uh, Leonardo and so on. Okay, so these are robots uh, to a certain extent, okay, uh, they try to find a market okay, uh, to, to promote this to kids okay, as a companion robots, as a social robots, okay, uh, which is not so scary. Okay? Because uh, if just imagine if say you have a, a, a AI robots, okay, it looks exactly as a human or a, as a, a small, small kids. Okay? Sometimes the parents may not, uh, they may, may be a bit worried. Okay? Uh, where, whether this this uh, no the, the AI robot is too smart uh, for for some others okay, and do some other things okay? so uh, but if it's the robot it looks like a, an animal okay so sometimes uh, emotionally it will be actually better uh, to use as a companion robot for kids okay? um, so there are another groups of robots okay, is where we call it as a Terry present robots okay? and this kind of robot actually it, Strictly speaking, it's not really very intelligent, okay? but it's a group of robots that are currently, especially in this uh, pandemic uh, uh, situation, okay? this is very popular whereby, you know, uh, say for example, we have uh, two uh, or, or someone okay, at a very remote area, uh, you do not, uh, or we cannot meet each other. Okay? So this robot actually, uh, you, you can call in, okay? And then the robot, the person can actually remotely control the robot to move around. Okay, uh, just imagine if you are not at home, but you have uh, one of these robots, and then you can remotely control this one, uh, move around in uh, at home, and then try to try to take care or or, or try to see uh, your parents, and then also uh, try to you know uh, do a simple control uh, in in the at, at home. Okay, so it is actually a Terry present. Okay. And uh, they have uh, come with a video cameras, speakers, microphone, so that they can interact with each other okay, uh, at a remote uh, manner. So uh, then, well, of course, if we are talking about AI robots, okay, we also uh, cannot uh, avoid to talk about uh, robot soldier. Okay? And in fact, if you look at the, the history, most of the technology actually they started uh, because of the military application. Okay? So uh, one of the um, one of the uh, objective of AI robot is actually also uh, try to replace human in in uh, some uh, to do some work which is actually uh, is uh, maybe uh, may endanger the, the human uh, life okay or maybe uh, no uh, like for example we send the robot to war instead of you send a human to war okay so uh, so there are some robot soldiers that have been developed uh, uh, nowadays okay, where they use this one uh, to you know, to to uh, go send for uh, some missions okay uh, auto security operation uh, patrolling or surveillance application uh, uh, also for your information there are, there are some research also on a uh, superhuman okay superhuman is actually a project that you want to you know uh, there is a variable robot exo exoskeleton where uh, after you wear this one, you become a superhero, okay, uh, uh, like Iron Man. Okay, so uh, this kind of uh, mechanism or the the mechanical uh, mechanical variable exoskeleton is actually try to give uh, extra strength okay, by uh, some uh, power. Okay, uh, the, the external electric uh, power. Okay, that can uh, boost up the strength of your muscles, you know, the speed, uh, the endurance, and so on. So this is also uh, you no know, uh, some form of uh, research uh, going on. Well, uh, if you look at all these different types of robot, okay, uh, especially when now today we are talking about the robot with uh, intelligence, okay, with some uh, uh, thinking, okay. So is robot good or bad? Okay? Uh, that actually uh, the choice is uh, uh, by humans, okay. Uh, if if I would to could, okay. Uh, they, they actually have a law of robotics, okay? Uh, in the year of uh, 1942, uh, someone called this uh, Isaac uh, Eisenberg already come up with three laws of robotics, okay? Uh, it says that a robot may not injure a human being 
or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Okay. And rule number two is a robot must obey orders given to it by human beings, except uh, where such order would conflict with the first law. Okay? And number three is a robot must not must protect itself from being uh, uh, hurt. Okay? So this is actually the, the fundamental law of robotics if you want to you know uh, later involved in a robotics research. Uh, basically, it means a robot may may not injure a human. Okay? Uh, this is uh, the main uh, important thing. But then uh, today, since we have AI robots that you can send it to, uh, say, to the war, you know, a robot soldier and, and, and uh, all these uh, different types of robots. Okay? So uh, a fully autonomous robot, uh, how are we going to control them? Uh, are they allowed to kill a human? Okay? Uh, and and uh, who make this? Kind of call and who who actually decide okay whether the robot is a good or bad yeah okay? uh, isn't it is it actually uh, all because of the human um, actually there are also some debates now okay uh, next generation next generation of robot okay they should be our partners rather than they are actually competing with human uh, to find jobs and other things they should also assist human and they should also uh, know uh, try to uh, contribute to the realization of a safe and peaceful society. Okay, so in the past, robots helps humans. Okay, in the uh, all these uh, uh, industrial automation, you no, know, uh, help to uh, increase the productivities, increase the efficiency. But when robot works, okay, human will actually stay away because uh, this is very dangerous for robots to to work together with human because uh, it may accidentally uh, harm a human if it is not uh, careful. Okay. But today, uh, we we have this kind of uh, idea to work together with robots. So we call it as a collaborative robots. Okay? Robot work together with human and make sure that they will not harm human. Okay. So uh, my final uh, remarks is that AI robot will coexist and cooperate with humans. This is actually uh, the way forward. Okay. Uh, whatever AI robots or whatever robots that we are going to design in today or in future. Uh, they have to be uh, work together and uh, work together. Human and robots they should work together. Okay, and uh, safety and interdependability will become more and more important than the velocity and execution and also the ac uh, accuracy. Okay, so I think I will stop here. Uh, I will accept your Q and A uh, later. Okay, thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Doctor Ku Won Chen. It was very detailed explanations in all the robot types and the kind of potential that robot could bring to the real world. Uh, for our Q&A session, I would like to go back to uh, Dr. Faisal. Uh, Dr. Faisal, we received one question here from our audience. Uh, the question is, can I use my master's degree from an English speaking institution to meet the English proficiency requirement at your programs? Dr. Faisal. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mustafa. Um, yeah, actually, um, uh, <clears throat> for those uh, from uh, English speaking institution, whether locally or uh, from overseas, from overseas, basically you need uh, IELTS. From uh, for local local institution, uh, previously you need to have uh, MUET. So basically, yes, um, you, know, you can use uh, uh, this, you know, uh, English uh, requirement okay, that you use from your. <clears throat> uh, Institution, institution before, okay, for this uh, master's at MMU. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Faisal. Okay, my next question is to uh, Dr. Ku. Dr. Ku, uh, another question from our audience. I have a bachelor degree in engineering. What do you think best for me? Question mark. MBA or masters of science in engineering, business and management? Question mark. So if you have uh, you have a bachelor in engineering, okay, right, uh, okay. So uh, well, it depends on your interest. So if you want to be a scientist, okay, or you are very interested in uh, doing further development work in related to uh, technology and science, then I would think you should go for master of science in engineering. Uh, but if say your your interest is actually more on uh, business side, okay? Because uh, as an engineer, you can also work as a manager, 
know, after you, you graduate, you become engineer, then later you become, say, a, a, a technical manager, and you can promote and you know, uh, uh, get all these uh, managerial position. So in that case, uh, then you can go and uh, get with the MPA. Okay? So, so all depends on your uh, interest and how, how you want to plan for your future career. Okay. Okay. Back to Dr. Faisal there. The next question is for Dr. Faisal here. Uh, can I contact directly to potential supervisor to discuss further on my research proposal? This is from Inquiry Mind and would like to apply for your programs. Okay, thank you, Mustafa. Uh, yes, uh, definitely you can uh, contact the potential supervisor directly. Actually, uh, when your application comes in, uh, basically you will go to uh, the IPS, Institute for Postgraduate Studies, which basically will forward it to faculty. The faculty actually will try to search the best uh, potential supervisors for the project. But if you already know of someone that you think is, uh, you know, uh, that you would like to work with him, then uh, of course you can uh, approach them, uh, email them, and then you can have a initial discussion first. Okay, and in the uh, application, you can also um, uh, include this uh, information. Okay, uh, this potential supervisor. Okay, in the application form as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice question. We received a lot of questions here. Yeah? Okay. Uh... Prof. Dr. Ku, here we have one more question. So where do you see AI robots technology headed to in our real world and in the future? Uh, okay, so uh, AI robot, as I mentioned, okay, uh, now the future trend is on the cooperative robots, okay, meaning uh, AI robots. Uh, now we we understand that AI robot they they are smart enough, okay, uh, but people worry that. AI robots, they may you know, uh, take away their job. Okay? So uh, the, the future actually is about uh, cooperation. So robots may not be able to do everything. They, are still, they still need a human to work together. Okay? So I guess the uh, technology uh, trend is to, to, to design robots, then to design all these kind of artificial intelligence uh, machines that they can uh, work together with human uh, to solve uh, problems, okay? Like for example, in uh, manufacturing industry, there will be things that the robot can do. There will be things that the human operators still need to uh, uh, do. So they have to do together. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, Dr. Visa, another question for you uh, from our audience. Uh, how is adding AI into your existing devices and processes transforming patients' outcomes? Question mark. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I think this directly, uh, you know, can transform okay, the patient uh, outcomes. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in my slides earlier, okay, first of all, the AI can help to improve the analysis and workflow okay, of the clinical practice. Okay? And um, they can help reduce the turnaround times, okay, meaning that, you know, the whatever analysis that being done can be faster. Okay? For example, okay, uh, uh, in the case of intraoperative diagnosis, meaning that um, the patient is actually uh, sitting on the operation table. Uh, in the case of brain cancer, for example, uh, you know, the, the surgeon actually uh, cut up, okay, open up his uh, head in order to, to obtain some uh, sample from the cancerous region. And um, whatever decision okay, that they need to make, need to be done within okay, this uh, period where the patient is still and, uh, on the operating table. For example, the decision has to be done within, let's say, 30 minutes. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, some cases, this can take uh, you know, hours for the pathologist to, you know, to do the diagnosis. So with AI, AI can help to reduce the time. So this can really help benefits the patient. Okay? All the diagnosis uh, can be done within, <clears throat> within uh, you know, the, the short period of time. Of course, uh, the AI is uh, used to assist the pathologist. In the end, pathologists, after consulting, you know, uh, this uh, uh, computer edit system, they themselves have to uh, come up okay, with the decision, okay, whatever to be done okay, for that particular patient. Uh, they can also reduce uh, error, like I mentioned just now. There are many errors that may come up, okay, uh, that may uh, committed by the pathologist or by the radiologist um, due to fatigue, okay, uh, or something else. So AI can help to reduce this. 
it can also be you know more consistent and also less biased okay uh, again you no know, whatever you involve human there's always some sort of a bias okay involved for example uh, in uh, grading uh, blood cancer for example okay uh, the doctors the pathologists have to look at, at you know uh, uh, let's say 10 different regions okay and then they have to choose these 10 different regions out of the possible more than i don't know 1000 region for example uh, so there is a bias you know depending on when where they are going to to choose the the, the region but if you do it with ai ai you know instead of 10 regions they can do it very quickly they can actually consider the entire the entire uh, slide for example the entire sample so this example of how adding ai okay uh, into this uh, device and process will transform patient outcomes directly or indirectly thank you oh, okay we just received one more questions here from our uh, youtube channel from shah uh, i think i'll I'll pose a question either to uh, Dr. Ku or Dr. Faisal. The question here is, hi, if I'm interested in doing PhD in fiber optic, especially telecommunication, to whom should I contact next? And I don't have particular topics uh, slash titles. Uh, Prof. Ku. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, uh, if you are from, I'm not sure you are from overseas or from, from Malaysia, like, okay? Uh, basically, you can go to our website, uh, either is our general, the mmu.edu.my, uh, or you can look for the Faculty of Engineering. So we have uh, two campuses. One is Faculty of Engineering in Cyberjaya. One is Faculty of Engineering and Technology in Malacca. Uh, you can get the uh, general the uh, email, okay? And then you just uh, write a, an email uh, we will, our, our faculty, there will be an admin person uh, that can actually direct you to the uh, correct uh, person in charge. Another is actually you go to our staff profile. I'm sure you will be able to look, uh, get our email address, you no? Know? Uh, or otherwise you just direct email to our general line and they will definitely will contact us. Uh, normally when we receive uh, some students who are interested to do PhD, uh, we will circulate among our faculty staff and then uh, who are, whoever are in this field, for example, you want uh, fiber optic, then we will pass your information to the professor or the lecturer who are interested in this topic and they will contact you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next question. Uh, we have a question from uh, Parmesh, Parmesh Jethi. Is that right? Parmesh. Jethi, okay. Uh, I think I have to ask this question to the Faisal. Hi, I'm holding a uh, Masters in no, engineering in mechatronic, mechatronic control. I'm not sure on the topics for PhD, possible to get the assistance from the right supervisor. I also have experience in working industry, industrial automations. This guy has master's in engineering in, in mechatronic, mechatronic, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Faisal, this is from YouTube. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this one probably, I think Dr. Ku also yeah, is yeah, uh, yeah, better yeah, to answer yeah, this because it's um, this. mechanical. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <Prokku then. laughs> yes. Uh, you already have a master in engineering in mechatronics. Okay. So uh, yeah. for PhD, I think you can move towards this um uh this particular area. Uh. Mechatronics actually is quite wide. Okay. You can either move into a uh, mechanical discipline, uh, some topic related to that, or you can also move towards this uh robotics. Okay. So uh, since you have experience in industrial automation. Uh, I would think it will be suitable for you to work something related to that uh, in nature. Okay? For example, say um, uh, some uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the latest development in the industrial automation, Industry 4.0 uh, related stuff, where you can have a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, interaction. There are some uh, intelligence on the uh, data analytics that applicable to the uh, uh, manufacturing uh, industry, uh, like for example, a uh, flexible manufacturing, uh, this um, uh, some topics related to the uh, same manufacturing execution system using a uh, uh, deep learning and also data analysis. So uh, I guess uh, it as as long as you have a master in this field and also you have experience working experience in this area, uh, you should find uh, in interesting topics. Uh, along this line uh, 
So uh, you want to get a right supervisor. Uh, uh, as I say, you maybe if possible, you drop an email to us. Uh, then uh, later we will try to match you with uh, a suitable uh, 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 supervisor. Okay? Um, you, you, you need to send us your CV, your background, uh, then we can further communicate. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we received just one last question. Last question, I think, from Yasmin Zamri. Hello. Thank you for the wonderful information that the speakers have uh, shared. I would like to know about the available scholarship and financial aid for the international student, if possible. This is another question from YouTube. Uh, do you have any answer for that, Lothar Faisal? <laughs> financial aid. Uh, in terms of scholarship, I think uh, it depends on uh, is this uh, question is on uh, the program by research or program by uh, process. If it's program by research, I think um, you know in the in our university's uh, RMC uh, website and also the IPS website, we have the you know uh, the, the professors have uh, grants, okay, uh, national grants, international grants, and then the. Uh, now with this grant, they are always looking for uh, students, okay, to help them, okay, uh, carry out research and so on. So there are a lot of this. Uh, in fact, we you know we we advertise this. Okay, we provide a list of all the available projects. Okay, uh, that is looking for uh, for students. So in terms of uh, you know, although we don't call it scholarships, okay, but here uh, in MMU, if you you know. Uh, if you're employed as the uh, GRA, you can uh, also do your your PhD or your master thesis, uh, your master study, and then it's like uh, doing uh, uh, two things at once. Okay, uh, and uh, but in terms of uh, actual scholarship, I think uh, I don't know if um, the Miss uh, Yus Yusrifa have uh, any additional uh, information or the uh, Prof Kovunchet have uh, additional information. Uh, okay, uh, I think, yeah, the, I will say, um, you know, uh, to first is we are everybody looking for postgraduate students, uh, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, we need students for us to further and continue research. So no worry about the scholarship, I will say. Uh, as long as a candidate, they are interest, they have this interest, they want to further study, uh, Definitely, we will try to help up and find uh, suitable, you no, know, uh, you no, know, all this assistant. Uh, we have like to for me, we have uh, some experience with uh, uh, the the uh, the international students. Uh, at first, they when they approach us, we don't really have uh, funding, but because uh, after we communicate, we we think there are some suitable topics for the student or the candidate. Then we jointly apply a grant, you no. Know, uh, we get uh, funding from uh, from the uh, we apply grant from through the uh, some some uh, ministry okay and uh, finally we once we get the grant then we will be able to get the, the candidate to join us and and today also no uh, there are, everything is virtual we can communicate uh, there are a lot of things you may start your research work even at uh, uh, no overseas and then along the way we will see how we can actually help up now. Okay, so no worry about the scholarship thing. It, it will be fine. Okay, thank you, Prof. Koo. Uh, we have come to an end here. And uh, to add to that question, I think students can visit the web, our website and go to the scholarship information, and you may get a lot of information from there. Uh, okay, we have running out of time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar uh, series. Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Faisal uh, and Professor Dr. Ku Won Chet. Uh, thank you for sharing your insight and expertise uh, on your research area. If you have any uh, additional questions or would like to connect directly with us, you just go to our MMU uh, Postgraduate Virtual uh, Open Days uh, from 23rd till the 29th of August 2031 on our Facebook page and MMU YouTube channel. Uh, your, our team will respond to you. You can either reach out directly using the contact information on our website. Uh, thank you for the time and you have a wonderful rest of your day ahead. Thank you.
everyone. Multimedia University, because MMU is you. Leading the digital future. Visit mmu.edu.my.